Hi, my name is Bill Mould, and I use a deep knowledge of physics and mechanical engineering to design and build bicycle wheels. And we're going to do a little bit of a study on this Class 2 e-bike wheel, meaning it is on a bicycle that has a throttle instead of pedal assist. This wheel here suffered from three major problems. Poor spoke lengths, poor choice of spokes, and poor spoke angles. We'll look first at spoke lengths. Here's a good close-up of a spoke and a nipple. The spoke has 21 threads and the nipple has 19 threads. This is a drawn to scale image of a spoke. It's a two millimeter spoke. The threads are rolled on. The major diameter crest to crest is 2.2 millimeters. The minor diameter is the root to root 1.8 millimeters. Here I am positioning three nipples that you can see in cross section. The dashed line represents, in each case, where the threads begin. In this first picture, we see the nipple having been screwed on so that the spoke comes approximately to the bottom of the slot. But you see on the, on the right there that there are three or four threads which are not buried in the nipple, and those are going to be weak points on the spoke. This is a better picture here, where the nipple is going on till the spoke comes to the top of the slot, but it's still not quite far enough because I still have a thread or two that is exposed down here. This is a better picture where all of the threads of the spoke are buried in threads of the nipple. A few more graphics. We start screwing the nipple on. If we have reached full tension and we have a picture like this, then the spoke is way too short. This is better, still better, and still better. But the problem is we still have a weak point right here. Especially if the spoke has to depart the nipple at some kind of an angle. Now it appears that this nipple will not screw on any farther because I have run out of threads. Uh, between the nipple and the spoke. If I look at this hardness scale, you see that stainless steel is much harder than either brass or aluminum, the materials in nipples. Here is a picture of a nipple that I have screwed onto a spoke much farther than you would normally see it. And here are two nipples in cross section. The nipple on the right, that cross section is a, is a nipple in perfect condition. And we see next to the red bracket, all of those threads. If you look at the nipple on the left, that is one that I screwed onto a spoke way beyond the point that one normally would do so, and then took it off and then ground it down so you could see the threads. And you can see on the left how those same threads have all been flattened down. Aluminum nipples give us the same picture. So even though it appears that this nipple won't go on any farther, it will. And then perhaps look like this. I would much rather see when the wheel is at full tension, a picture that looks like the top than the one at the bottom. Here are some spokes for the wheel in question that I had to redesign. The top one is not broken, but three underneath it are broken spokes, and they all broke in the threads. So the spokes in my wheel were too short. Um, now let's go on and talk about the choice of spokes. Here is a picture of a wheel with no load on it. But when there is a load on it, the spoke at the bottom as it goes through the load-bearing zone, the, the rim bends up slightly, the spoke becomes slightly shorter, and the tension decreases. I set up this apparatus in my laboratory so I could take some really accurate readings of spoke tension. As I measured spoke tension, my friend Carlos recorded the data into an Excel spreadsheet. The bike is mounted on a treadmill, and you see some chains attached to a rod that goes through the bottom bracket. The chains connect to a swing which I can raise and lower with a jack and I have, depending on the test I'm doing, between 240 and 310 pounds on the bottom bracket. 
by manually moving the treadmill, I can one at a time bring spokes into the load bearing zone. So I would measure the tension of a spoke in the load bearing zone and every other drive side spoke tension as well, and then move the wheel 30 degrees and do it all over again. This is the rhythmic pattern that occurs over and over again. Every 180 degrees, a spoke goes in through the load bearing zone. The tension decreases very sharply. In between those um, spikes downward, the tension goes up a little or down a little bit, but not very much in comparison to what happens at the bottom of the load bearing zone. This is some dynamic uh, test results done by a professor at uh, Duke University who's a friend of mine, and we see in dynamic uh, riding, instead of a laboratory, actual road conditions, you see the same type of repeating pattern. This is the actual data. We started with spokes that had 798 uh, newtons, approximately 80 kilograms of uh, force, and you see over on the right the percentage changes in the spokes as they go around the wheel and the big change occurs at the bottom. Interestingly, the tension on the unloaded wheel all added up and the vertically loaded wheel all added up is about the same. Now this is the same wheel when the starting tension is raised from about 80 kilograms to about 130. And if you look at the results on the right that you see much smaller changes in tension the spoke at the bottom of the load bearing zone loses tension, but not nearly as much as it did when the wheel was, was built at a lower starting tension. Again, the total tension of the spokes of the unloaded wheel and the loaded wheel is about the same. Here is the graph of the high tension wheel. A side-by-side -side comparison of two identical wheels, the only difference being the amount of tension that is built into them. It's the one on the left, the low tension wheel, the one on the right, the higher tension wheel. Just for comparison, this is a 32 spoke wheel and we're looking at the um, 16 spokes on the uh, drive side and uh, we're gonna see what those results look like. My starting tension, nice high tension and the results when the wheel is under load. Once again, between the unloaded and loaded wheel, about the same total tension. Just comparing these two wheels, the one on the left, a 24-spoke wheel, the one on the right, a 32-spoke wheel, both set for nice high tension, and we see the uh, pretty much the same repeating pattern. If I'm riding a bike at 22 miles per hour, every spoke in the wheel is going to get jerked about five times every second. We will now compare these three spokes. The top one is a straight gauge 2.3 millimeter spoke. The middle is a straight gauge 2 millimeter spoke. And the third one is a double butted spoke. 2 millimeters at the ends and 1.8 millimeters in the middle. From the Supreme website, I can obtain the middle section strength in newtons per square millimeter. If I multiply that by the cross-sectional area of the spoke in the middle, I get these readings of tensile strength in newtons, kilograms of force, and in pounds. Here again is the tensile strength in newtons and kilograms of force. If I have a target tension of 120 kilograms of force, you can see that my target tension is a long way from the tensile strength of the spoke. So at no point um, when I'm building a wheel or riding on it do I fear breaking the tensile strength of the spoke. But we have to worry about something called the yield tension. By conducting tests and interpreting the results, I found that I had a yield point of this Supreme race spoke of 143 kilograms of force. So looking at that race spoke on the bottom, the double butted spoke, whereas I have a very comfortable difference between its tension on the spoke and its uh, tensile strength, the difference between the tension and the yield point is not so great. 
spokes are elastic, which is mathematically expressed as something called the modulus of elasticity. Without getting bogged down in math, let me just make the point that the strain, which is a measure of the stretching of a spoke as the tension changes, is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area, meaning that the double-butted spoke you see here at the bottom will stretch more when, it, when tension is put on it than the one at the top. Now, the weak points of spokes are at the elbow and the threads. By having most of the stretching taking place as the rhythmic changes of tension occur, in the middle section, I draw those stress points away from the ends where the spoke is vulnerable. But the spoke that was used in the wheel in question was unwisely chosen because I have a thicker spoke in the middle and it's thinner at the ends, the exact opposite of what it should be. I rebuilt the wheel with Supreme Force spokes that are 2 millimeters at the threaded end, the other end 2.2 millimeters at the elbow, but 1.8 in the middle. So this is actually a triple butted spoke. These are the two spokes in question. The original spoke on the top was only 212 millimeters, so it was too short as well as being a poor choice. Instead, I used 216 millimeter uh, Supreme Force spokes. Lastly, we look at poor spoke angles. This is a scale drawing of a bicycle rim and a normal type of road hub with uh, the whole flange diameter visible. We have nipples, and here you can see that if I attach a spoke to the flange uh, tangential to the whole flange circle, compared to the radius, I have a four degree uh, angle there, which is not bad. But a wheel like this has a diameter of nominally 559 millimeters, but a flange that is 170 millimeters whole flange diameter. So I have this picture, which is also to scale. Attaching a spoke shown here gives me a 17 degree angle. If I put the spoke here, it's 14 degrees. The least angle I can possibly have is still going to be 7 degrees, twice what it was with the road hub. And that's why I have these really nasty looking articulation angles from the nipple to the spoke. Here is a graphic of a spoke bed and a nipple. The nipple can limitedly swivel to align itself with the spoke. But it can't angle farther than this because it will hit the side of the hole. Possibly leading to this picture here. But if I take my Dremel tool, I can cut just a little bit of aluminum from that side of the hole. So that it looks like this. And when I do that, I go from this picture to this picture. Here is the before and after, where at the bottom you see the nipple is able to swivel a little bit more uh, without hitting the side of the hole. And then looking at some photos from my wheel, this is the before and after, where you see that the nipple spoke alignment is greatly improved. So that's that. Um, after a lot of work and a lot of uh, calculations and careful planning, I was able to totally redesign this wheel and eliminate the three problems that caused the failures that I mentioned to you. I hope you found that interesting and thought-provoking. Here is my contact information.